The name of this movie is Cellular Automata, film and narration by Rudy Rucker. That's me talking. Okay, so this is what I look like. I'm here in my office here. And uh, the software I want to show you is uh, something that I wrote for Autodesk with John Walker, also of Autodesk. And uh, the thing is called CA Lab. And uh, what we want to show is a whole lot of cellular automata. Okay, now, what are cellular automata? Well, let's dig in and, and start seeing what some of them look like. This first cellular automaton is an example of a process which reproduces itself. It was created by Christopher Langton. The idea here is that we imagine the plane covered with individual squares or cells. Each cell has a color value. This creature here is a pattern of green cells surrounding a circulating loop of variously colored cells. In effect, it behaves like an organism whose skin is the green cells and whose DNA is the circulating loop. The DNA splits into two at the corners and at the tip of the growing tip it creates a new copy of the organism. It's a very pretty example of machine reproduction. If we randomize the start condition, however, nothing happens. It requires a specific start and a specific rule. Now we look at some options where we change the rules different kinds of things can happen. We can have uh, low activity rules or we can have very high activity rules. Christopher Langton's inspiration, by the way, was the work of Stanislaw Ulam and John von Neumann in the late 40s and early 1950s. Von Neumann wanted to design a machine which could build copies of itself, proving that self-reproduction is not linked to any mysterious vitalism, but is an information theoretic property of any that can be achieved by abstract systems. Langton's work was to clean up their uh, definition of a self-reproducing automaton and find much simpler kinds of pattern that does it. The things we're looking at now are variations. These, again, most of these don't have self-reproduction abilities. This cellular automaton is called the rug rule and is based on the simple idea of having each cell have a value between 0 and 255 and each cell successively takes its new value to be the average of the neighbor values plus 1. This is to some extent a model of Laplace's equation for heat flow in the plane. Imagine a metal sheet and think of the black square that you see there as being a cold region and imagine there being another region, a white square, which is less easy to see, which is hot. As I drag the cold region around, the cells that are near it adjust their value to be closer to the neighborhood average, which is being pulled down by the presence of the low cold zero cell, and uh, interesting trails develop. Because of the fact that we're adding 1, and if we get a value larger than 256, we wrap back to 0, we have the a boiling effect happening. Now suppose that we zero out the screen and keep the rug rule and freeze the boundaries to be at uh, some fixed value. What happens is the cells near the boundary reach a stable equilibrium. The cells towards the center, however, begin to enter a steady sort of oscillation. This oscillation is again caused by the fact that we're taking the average of the neighbors, adding one, and then taking the new value modulo 256. The oscillations of the central region are again governed by Laplace's equation and could be compared to the oscillations observed in the membrane of a drum head. I can change the color map so that I simply have black and white coloring and this brings some of the structure out a little more clearly. We have a very interesting sort of endlessly various oscillation happening here. 
One of the aspects of cellular automata is that it's easier to run a CA simulation than it would be to mathematically predict what the state is going to be after some given number of steps. What I've done now is to slide the pattern a little bit to the left to break the left-right symmetry. So the top and bottom copy halves are symmetric, but the left and right halves are no longer symmetric. If you were to look at this image sideways by turning your head sideways, you'll see something that at times resembles a sort of chromium robotic face. I call this pattern Maxine Headroom because it seems to me the famous computer animation character Max Headroom, if he had a wife, she might perhaps look like this. Another simile that occurs is that what we see is a little bit like the patterns of ripples in a basin of water if we were to disturb it and let the ripples bounce around. A cellular automata computation is essentially a parallel computation where each cell is obeying the same rule at the same time. This cellular automaton is the famous game of life invented by John Horton Conway in the late 60s and popularized by Martin Gardner in some Scientific American columns in the early 70s. In the game of life, each cell is either on or off. The cells look at their neighbors, again they look at eight neighbors, that is to say a cell is thought of as the center of a three by three grid, and uh, it sums up the number of neighbors which are on. If a cell is off and it has exactly three neighbors on, it gets turned on, otherwise it goes to off. If a cell is already on, if it has either two or three neighbors on, it goes stays on. What I've done here is add a die to the life rule, so if a cell has been on for two generations, it was purple. Okay, now we're into the next rule already, and this rule is called the brain rule, invented by Brian Silverman. This rule has three states. There's the off state, the firing whitish state, and a refractory or resting state, which is colored orangish. In brain, a cell which has two firing neighbors turns on, a cell which is on goes to the resting state, a cell which is resting goes to the dead state. Brain produces a very rich family of gliders and uh, certain small patterns called butterflies. There's one moving. This is yet another early cellular automaton rule, a variation of a rule invented by Edward Fredkin at MIT. In Fredkin's rule, a cell counts up the number of neighbors which are on. If this number is odd, the cell goes to on. If it's even, the cell goes to off. The color is introduced here by keeping track of the cell's last seven states and coloring it accordingly. Fredkin's rule enjoys a very simple property of self-reproduction in that any starting pattern will eventually recur. So we'll see nine copies of our original square coming back in a little while. A striking thing about this rule is the number, is the complexity of the patterns that we get. Okay, this rule you're looking at here is the vote rule, invented by Gerard Vishniak. Here each cell takes a uh, majority vote between being on and off among itself and its eight nearest neighbors. This is a high-resolution view of life. The pattern you see here is the famous glider gun discovered by William Gosper. If I randomize the screen, I again see life seething here. This is the coloring where the cells that have been on for two generations are a dull background color. The cells that have just turned on are green, I believe, and the cells that have just died are blue. It's an amazing amount of activity generated. However, most life patterns will eventually die out. Now if I switch the rule to brain, 
I see a widespread self-propagating pattern of gliders with here and there a small butterfly going diagonally. Most of the brain patterns move either horizontally or vertically. This was an attempt to cross brain and life. What's happening here is in the red zone the life rule is obeyed and in the black zone the brain rule is obeyed. At the interface between the two zones, stimulation is provided to the other rule. Those bars that we see in the red zone are actually life patterns that were coming off the top edge. They break up and form lots of little life oscillators, gliders, and so on. In the top region, we see brain cells being turned on at the interface. This is a different way of fusing life and brain and also using the vote rule. The yellow land is determined by vote, which again is a majority vote. It's not quite a simple majority vote, I didn't mention earlier. If there's a tie or a near tie, the election is awarded to the person who had less votes. I call this rule the ranch rule. We have brain living in the water or black region. We have life living on the sand or yellow region. And it's possible for the brain cells to get ashore and turn on life activity if the shore erodes away exposing a stable, some kind of life block, it turns on activity in the brain region. This rule is called the Fader's Rule. It was invented by me and is a cr different way of crossing life and brain. Instead of being an ecological cross between life and brain, it's a genetic cross. That is to say, the rule in some respects behaves like life, in other respects behaves like brain. The definition of the rule is that if you're a black dead cell and you have two firing neighbors, you turn on. If you have two firing neighbors and you're already on, you stay on. But then instead of going to off, you go through a cycle of 127 refractory states. The small white objects that you see exploding from time to time, these are called fader eggs. Each of them is a pattern of three cells that are turned on. They're able to sustain themselves. And when the refractory zone around them uh, vanishes, new activity is turned on. These are sort of like seeds waiting for the proper season to hatch. Extraordinary amount of beautiful structure occurs here from this rather simple rule and a start pattern of simply a single fader egg. This is a slightly different rule related to faders. This is I call this range. It produces double spirals that are characteristic of the so-called Jabotinsky reaction. And faders and range are both examples of a wide family of rules that are called the Unlucky rules and are easy to investigate using the CA Lab software from Autodesk. All of the patterns you see are being generated in real time using CA Lab software. This is another example of a so called Jabotinsky rule. This pattern, this rule was discovered by Margolis and Toffoli and is called Tube Worms and appears on the cover of their book Cellular Automaton Machines from MIT Press. Jabotinsky originally was a chemist who produced these double scroll patterns in Petri dishes with a solution of malic acid catalyzed by palladium crystals. It turns out that very many two-dimensional CAs produce Jabotinsky patterns. What characterizes a Jabotinsky pattern is that you can start from a random initial condition, which is what we're doing here, and evolving out of this complete lack of information or complete disorder is a uh, stable 
patterns that have a kind of order to them, these double scroll Jabotinsky patterns. To my eye, they look a little bit like fetuses, and it's suggestive to think that we're modeling a sort of bottom-up creation of something akin to an, a living organism. Bottom up in the sense that we have it evolving out of a chaotic condition, out of a completely sludgy initial condition. This rule that we're looking at now is called the hodgepodge rule and was invented by Gerhardt and Schuster. It was originally described in a column in Scientific American by Key Dudney. I've changed the color palette now, adding a little blue so we can see the edges of the Jabotinsky scrolls a little more easily. And if we select a different color palette, we'll see patterns that look somewhat like microtome sections of organic tissues. As time goes by, the pattern gets more and more intricate. It also has a sort of self-replicating feature in that we notice small double spirals spinning off the end of the original one. Another suggestive thing here is these are somewhat like vortex tubes. Here's a pattern that I call cell, and this is really a rug rule, an averaging rule, starting out on a certain special initial pattern, which was really a rectangle with a hole cut out of it. And it produces a pattern which looks a lot like a biological cell, although the function of what's going on here is really just a matter of the cells taking the average of their neighbor's values. That's the face of Bob Dobbs, a trademark of the Church of the Subgenius. And if we apply a uh, variation of a Jabotinsky rule to him, we get an interesting sequence of images. This is an example of one use of cellular automata. A rather simple use is for image processing. You can scan in any kind of photographic image and subject it to a CA rule for some number of cycles and produce different kinds of animations. This is the same rule, which is actually called the Bob rule, but with color and it's been running for a long time. We cut out a house-shaped region, and we generate an effect like fire or like plague. This is another example of image processing. We've taken an image from Autodesk Animator and put the brain rule on top of it, producing a kind of activity on the frog's skin. This is a new feature we'll be adding to release 2 of CA Lab when it appears, an ability to interface with Animator so that we can take Animator images, change them using cellular automata, and create Animator movies of them. That's a kind of gas rule being applied to disperse the face of a clown. Again, this is a simple kind of image processing an easy way to get interesting effects. Here's a more traditional representation of a gas. This is modeled on the HPP rule described in Margolis and Toffoli. And we have effectively two regions of gas that are contained in two yellow containers. We call this rule the perfume rule. And what you note here is that the perfume has more trouble getting out of the bottle that has the stopper. The actual program is such that a blue particle will keep moving along a diagonal direction until it encounters either a yellow or a blue particle. At that point, it makes a right angle change in direction. Notice the resonating of the pressure at the center of the gas vessels. It started out with a high pressure region, it dispersed out to the walls, bounces back, so you have this sort of ringing being simulated. 
Comte fully speaks of cellular automata as programmable matter. That's the Autodesk rat being subjected to a gas rule. It's one way of doing a dissolve. We've managed to attach a color to each of the gas particles, so we see vestiges of the rat. This is a lovely rule invented by David Griffith, and I call it the EAT rule. And what's going on here is that we have 128 different states, and each state can be eaten by the next higher state. The way it works is that each cell looks merely at one of its eight neighbors at each update. We use a randomizer, actually a CA-based randomizer, to pick the neighbor. If that neighbor has a value one higher than the cell, then the cell takes on that neighbor's color. So the yellow eats into the red, the green eats into the yellow, the blue eats into the green. In the outer region, the fuzzy looking region, there's a mixture of all the 128 different states, and that region is pretty stable because most of the cells don't happen to be next to a cell whose state is exactly one higher, so not much eating is taking place. But in the central region, which touches all along the edge, there's usually likely to be found a cell which is able to eat into the existing color. These patterns look a bit like planetary weather patterns, or, of course, they look like Easter eggs as well. Griffith and his co-worker Fish established that the eat rule leads to Jabotinsky spirals. If we trim away part of the region, we can see and start with a small piece of randomized cells, we can see the EATS rule generating Jabotinsky scrolls. This is a speeded up version of an N-Lucky rule related to faders and related to rain jaw. And it's running faster because I've stored it as a sequence of frames as a RAM movie. Also stored into the sequence of frames is a couple of edit moves. Using CA Lab, you can edit the image. You can draw in disks or polygons, whatever you like, of different colors, and look what happens to them as they are subjected to the activity of the rule. This is another stored RAM movie, a rule called Rug Boil. It's related to rug, but and also we're using the arrow keys to slide the pattern around while we're taping it. This is a RAM movie, which could be converted into an auto animator fly file, or an animator flick file, and it's a movie of a Griffith rule, but not with 128 states. I believe this one is with eight states only. So it somewhat more quickly develops the Jabotinsky spirals. That, I feel, is one of my main discoveries playing with the CA Lab software, is how common the Jabotinsky spirals are in the world of 2D cellular automata. Prior investigations done by Wolfram had suggested there are four classes of CAs, the ones that die, the ones that become periodic, the ones that seethe, and the ones that show glider patterns moving around. I think the Jabotinsky generating patterns could be legitimately thought of as a fifth fundamental class of cellular automata. They probably were not noted explicitly by Wolfram because no, nothing like a Jabotinsky pattern really occurs in the one-dimensional CA rules that he looked at. Here's a Jabotinsky pattern that we've mapped onto the surface of a three-dimensional robot model. This is using Autodesk Animator and a new Autodesk product called Autodesk 3D Studio. I find this image very lovely because it reflects my original inspiration for working with CAs, which was the so-called flicker cladding, which the robots I write about in my novels Software and Wetware have. 
my feeling was that robots should have interesting things going on in their skin, just like people have expressions. So we had the notion of putting CAs onto the robot's skins. That particular image was created by Grant Blaha of Autodesk. This rule is another discovery of Christopher Langton. He calls them virtual ants. Key Dudney has also written about them, calling them termites, with T-U-R as in Turing. These things behave effectively like two-dimensional Turing machine heads. That is to say, the bright regions, the bright little squares, at any given time have a direction they're moving in. If they find a red cell, they paint it gray and turn left. If they find a black or a gray cell, they paint it red and turn right. The memory of what the, the virtual ant or termite has done is contained as a pattern in the plane. Here's one rather frivolous use of these vants. Virtual ants are called vants for short, is to use them to grow lace. If I start a vant at the edge of a large red square, it'll begin crawling along the edge and generating gray and red cells, embroidering, as it were, lace along the edges of the thing. If you let them go for quite a long time, really very elaborate of patterns of lace can be grown. The code for this rule is actually an own code rule. It's not supplied with CA Lamp Release 1, but we will be supplying it with CA Lamp Release 2. To create this rule, I wrote a new inner loop in assembly language, and CA Lamp has the ability to link a new inner loop in and generate essentially any cellular automaton which can possibly be described as far as I know of. Here we fed a three-color Autodesk ad to a rule called Wator. Wator was described by Key Dudney in a Scientific American column a few years ago. And the idea is that we have several species of creatures moving around in a toroidal world. We say toroidal, meaning the left side of the screen connects to the right side and the top connects to the bottom. The three species we have here are blue sharks, green fish, and brick red shrimp. The specks of lighter colors you see are newborns. The way the rule works is that if a fish is next to a shrimp, it eats it and sets its hunger to zero. If a shark is next to a fish, it eats it and sets its hunger to zero. With each step that a fish doesn't eat a shrimp, its hunger gets higher. If its hunger reaches some cutoff value, the fish dies. If the fish manages to reach a certain age, it reproduces, splitting into two fish. The same thing is true for the sharks. This develops a kind of stable ecology and produces patterns that look a little bit like Jabotinsky patterns. I think if we had a larger picture, we would see them. What we've got here is another new feature that we're adding to CA Lab 2.0. That's a histogram or bar graph which shows the relative populations at any given time. We see here there's a lot of blue sharks, even more red shrimp, and less fish. Now we've changed the rule to the rug rule, and we're going to look at the bar graph and see what happens to the histogram here. The rug rule, you remember, you're taking your neighborhood average and adding one. So there's this hump of uh, common values that's sl sliding up to the right. Now the hump doesn't quite simply slide off the right end because since there's no values higher than the right end value, it's actually hard for a point for a cell to reach that maximum value. So the hump tends to linger at the high end with bits of it spilling over and marching up towards the right. The small peaks that you see, the tiny small ticks that you see in the histogram, uh, have to do with the way the pattern was initialized. 
though the detailed explanation of them is a little more complicated than that. If we let the road rule evolve for a long time from a symmetric start, this is the high resolution road rule, we get a pattern something uh, like this, and we get a kind of stable histogram like this, with again the ticks being really an echo of the original Big Bang when we started out with everybody in sync. If I change to the Hodge rule, that's a Jabotinsky style rule, and look at the bar graph for that, we see the characteristic thing of a Hodge rule is that the cells evolve rug-like, but when they reach a maximum value, they're forced to wait there, synchronize with each other, and then roll back down. This is Tim Leary's face being fed to the vote rule. This is the Autodesk logo being fed to the time tunnel rule, a rule created by Margolis and Toffoli. This particular demonstration was in fact the first CA Lab demo that we had, and it was created by John Walker. The interesting thing about the time tunnel rule is that unlike other CA, lab, CA rules, it preserves information. That is to say, at any time, you can make the rule run backwards. One possible application of CAs would be for encryption. You can let a, C, a reversible CA, such as time tunnel, run on a rule until the screen is quite altered from the start condition. And then you can ship the alt, this weird looking screen to somebody and have, and that's right now is the point where we're turning around, and then have him run the backwards version of the rule to restore the original pattern. There's also the property that things don't move across boundaries in the time tunnel rule. So outside we have symmetric simple patterns based on the outer appearance of the square. On the inside of the square we have messy patterns because of the fact that the bitmapped Autodesk logo is not perfectly symmetric. And now we're back to where we started. Here's Tim again, and we're turning his face into a gas which is sticking to the Autodesk logo. Whenever a white particle touches a red particle, it turns red and stops moving. Examples of this have been seen a lot in physics. It, patterns like this are called accretion fractals. Accretion meaning sticking to and fractal because of the dendritic behavior. Here's a cleaner example of an accretion fractal. This once again was inspired by a column by Key Dudney. And what's going on here is the blue particles are obeying a gas rule, bouncing off each other, and whenever they touch a yellow particle, they stick to it. We get a very dendritic, branching kind of growth at the tips. Why does it branch like that? Well, it's easier for a gas particle to bump into the tip of one of these dendrites than it is to find its way all the way down into one of the bays. There's an odd three-dimensional illusion that occurs here. It really looks as if the blue particles are behind the yellow particles. This is the office of the future with a cellular automaton running inside the rug. We're hoping to build some offices in cyberspace that look a little bit like this.
Okay, uh, this is a CA Lab package, uh, and you can order your own by phoning 1-800-882-8200. Um, one eight hundred eight eight two eight two eight four. It costs fifty nine ninety five, and it's called CA Lab. And even if you don't buy it, that's okay, because you might not have a computer and you just wanted to see this video and see a bunch of CAs. And I hope you've enjoyed it. And uh, I think that CAs are going to be important for all of us uh, in image processing in physical simulation, image generation, and also as a laboratory for artificial life. Thanks for uh, enjoying this with me.